morning. Welcome to our service here at New Life Church in Toulon, Manitoba. My name is Henry Ozerny and I'm the interim pastor here at New Life. Thanks for joining us this morning as we've gathered together to worship the Lord. We have a wonderful hymn of the Christian faith that we're going to start off the service with, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and it's uh, sung by the choir at First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and I know you will enjoy this traditional hymn of the faith, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Our scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 11, and we're following the uh, New International Version. We're reading from that. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Would you join with me in the Lord's Prayer as we pray together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We have a few announcements we want to share with you uh, this morning, and that is that our services now are here at the church, Sundays 10 o'clock, and uh, with our capacity being uh, uh, opened right up, uh, you can just show up. You don't have to sign up. Just come and enjoy times of fellowship. The wearing of masks are optional. According to our government regulations, you can wear one if you choose, or you don't have to as well. And then our Thursday night Bible study is having a potluck supper this uh, coming Thursday, August the 26th, beginning at 6 p.m. at Tracy and Alvin Driscoll's in Inwood. Now the supper will be at 6 and the Bible study will be at 7. And I understand some folks may be a little bit anxious about uh, eating a community meal, kind of like a potluck is. And so if you wish to just join us for the Bible study at 7, you may do so. Uh, contact us at the church and let us know if you will be coming we we need to make all the arrangements and then following that we're starting up our thursday night bible studies beginning on the following thursday september the 2nd and 6 30 p.m we'll be meeting here at the church and i will be doing a series that i'm entitling questions jesus asked and on thursday september 2nd we will look at the statement that jesus makes uh, to the people of israel oh unbelieving and perverse generation how long shall I put up with you? So we're looking forward to having that time uh, in the Word. Join us uh, for those Bible studies here at the church Thursday evenings starting September 2nd, 6.30 p.m. We have another song, the song by the mandate entitled Faithful One. Faithful one, so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace, Lord.
Well, this morning we have a special treat. Uh, we have Chopper Wilson, who is part of the Baptist General Conference of Canada, uh, operating in the position which is called a district coach, who is joining us for our service today. And Chopper has put together the message this morning and we're looking forward to hearing from him. So Chopper, would you please come? And as you begin, I wanna pray for you, God's blessing on you as you share the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can hear the word of God as you've laid it on the heart of Chopper to share with us. We pray that as he ministers the word, our hearts will be encouraged uh, to follow through and to and truly provoke one another to love and good works. So we just commit this service to you. Pray your blessing on him as he speaks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Henry, for inviting me to be here and to share some time with the folks at Toulon. I greatly appreciate it. I'll, let me tell you a little bit about myself before we go into God's Word. Uh, first off, my name is Ken Wilson or Chopper, one and the same. Uh, you heard uh, Pastor Henry reference me as Chopper, and that's not a sign of a misspent youth or anything like that. Uh, nothing troubled in my past. It's just a nickname I've had for a long time. So I'm totally fine with either way, Chopper or Ken Wilson. Uh, this is a picture of my family that I've got up there. Actually, it's only a partial picture now because over COVID, I now have two son-in-laws. Um, my wife, Lisa, and I, we have four daughters and one grandson. So we are really, really enjoying spending time with him and the rest of our family and getting to know our grandsons better. And we just found out that we have a new grandchild that's going to be on the way in February. So we're really excited for that. Very thankful for uh, our family that God has given to us and the opportunity we've had to see them grow. Over the years, I've been involved, along with my wife, in a variety of different ministries. We served for 10 years in Northwest Ontario. That's where I was a missionary pilot, and we lived at a camp and also worked with First Nations people on reserve communities in the north. So we really enjoyed that, raised our family in that environment, and it was just outside of Sioux Lookout, Ontario. Did that, like I said, for 10 years. Uh, then we returned to the United States where I helped our family that had a business. And so I was a project manager for them for a few years. And then the Lord opened the door for us to return to ministry here in Canada. And that's when we came to Winnipeg. So we've been in Winnipeg for about the past 14 years and enjoyed being on staff at Grant Memorial Baptist Church. Served in everything there from uh, being the youth pastor to the missions pastor to an associate and then the executive pastor and uh, just really, really enjoyed our time being there. And then recently, the Lord opened the uh, door for us to become part of the Baptist General Conference, serving as the district coach. So many of you may have known Lauren, and so that's the position I've taken. As he's retired, I've stepped into that. Very thankful for the foundation that Lauren has set for me. And as the district coach for Central Canada with the Baptist General Conference, I have the opportunity of connecting with our churches, with our pastors, with the staffs at the churches, and getting to know them better, figuring out how do we support them. Uh, some of the things that we strive to do as the Baptist General Conference is to be better together. So how is it that we can support one another? What can we bring as a conference, but also how can our churches connect with one another to better to support one another? We're working on some initiatives to better align with the national office and the district office, which we really enjoy that. Working with Kevin Schuler, I'm sure you've met him, and just spending time together and figuring out, hey, how do we bring those national initiatives to our central district and see them expressed here? So very thankful for that. And I spent a lot of time uh, connecting with Kevin, with the other district coaches, and figuring out how to support our coaches, uh, our, our pastors and churches across this district as well. I want to say thank you to the people of Toulon for your support. Uh, it's significant that you are connected with and engaged in the Baptist General Conference, and it's a privilege to be able to come support you, but also represent you to the churches across our country uh, as I get to serve in this role. So thank you very much for that. That's a little bit of insight as to who I am and the role that I'm serving in. And before we go into God's Word, I would just like to pause for a moment of prayer and then we'll step right into that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the way that you have been at work through the ages past. And I pray this morning as we look into your word that we'll see that ancient truth, we'll understand how it makes a difference for us today. 
that we will see it lived out in our lives today and that people will know more about who you are because of the way we've interacted with them. So, Father, thank you for that. Thank you for this time that we have to look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I've got a question for you as we start. When is the last time that you provoked someone? You might not have expected that question to be coming. As a matter of fact, we don't even necessarily like that word as it's used today. But if you think about it, you might be able to come up with, a, oh, yeah, here's the occasion at which I provoked someone. It may be very recent, or you may have to work a little while to come up with something. You know, in our context, the word provoked always comes with a bit of a negative flair to it. And now uh, we, we resist that title being attached to us. If somebody uses the word, ooh, a provocateur, are you a provocateur? We, we shy away from that. It, some certain people may come to mind for you. You may think of, oh yes, here's this particular celebrity known as being a provocateur and nobody really likes them. Or you may have a resident provocateur in your home uh, and that's a bit of a challenge for you. What I want to say this morning as we go into God's Word, as we start to look at this, is that there actually is a biblical mandate that says we are called to be a provocateur. Now, I want you to hold on to that thought, because right now, the way we understand that word, it might not be a comfortable thought. But hold on to that, and maybe we'll come to a better understanding as we make our way through Scripture this morning. So with that thought in mind, I want us to turn our minds to the book of Hebrews. Now, you may already be familiar uh, with the book of Hebrews. There are a lot of things in there, a lot of really foundational pieces to our faith. They're found in the book of Hebrews. Some of the things you might be already familiar with is that there are significant portions of Hebrews that talk about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Big passages, big sections of this book talk about how he is far superior to anything that has come before. Also, there are very strong warnings in the book of Hebrews. And for that reason, some people shy away from it. Think, oh, wow, those are such harsh warnings to the people. But we're going to find out they come because of certain bad behaviors. There's also this passage that talks about the great cloud of witnesses. That's what we read a little bit earlier in Hebrews chapter 12. Many of us are familiar with that. That passage, it encourages us on because we have so many witnesses around us to continue on in the faith. And then one of the final things you might be familiar with is just that, the great hall of faith. The entirety of chapter 11 is given over to recognizing the people, the ancients that have gone before, that demonstrated faith and God demonstrated his faithfulness through them. So those are some things that you might already be familiar with from the book of Hebrews. But I want us to consider a couple of things that are, are broader in the context of Hebrews. First off is what, what's some of the mega message or something that permeates the whole book of Hebrews. There are two things that I want us to consider this morning. One is that God is faithful. He is faithful eternally and in the immediate circumstances of our life. And that continues as a thread throughout all of the book of Hebrews. It's also important to realize that understanding that, we are also called to take our place in God's faithfulness. And we'll see how that gets lived out as we continue on through uh, this book this morning. But God has been faithful in eternity past. He will be faithful for eternity in the future. And he is faithful in my immediate circumstances. And that is a message that we cannot get away from in, as we go through this book. Also, there are some mysteries that are still surrounding the book of Hebrews. First off, we don't really know who the author is. Uh, it's clear that the author had a firsthand relationship with the apostles. Uh, he references their teaching often and how he's been connected with them. So it's, okay, this is somebody that has credibility in the early church. Also, there are some mysteries that surround the audience. It's never clearly identified where this audience actually is. Now, there are some assumptions, there are some great clues there, because 
as we'll go through, it talks about their understanding of the Jewish culture, their deep understanding of the ancient culture and the Jewish people. So it's pretty safe to say, hmm, these were Jews, thus the name of the book, Hebrews. It's also um, clues given in the book that these were believers, these were followers of Jesus Christ who had undergone persecution. They had had property taken away, they had been imprisoned, they had faced oppression of many different kinds. So those things are really important to understand as we go through this book. These were the people receiving these words, these mess this message from the author. So with that, we're going to jump right into the book itself. So the first 10 chapters, this significant portion of the book, talks about um, the fact that the ancient promise was delivered. The ancient promise that God had made was now fulfilled in Jesus Christ. See, for us, we're missing out a little bit on that. Because for us, that's not a deep part of our culture. The people receiving this letter, they grew up from the moment they could read and speak. They were hearing the stories of God's promised deliverance from the ancient, ancient stories up through the present. So for them, it didn't take a lot for them to understand these promises are real promises that God made to our people in ages past, and they're coming alive for us today. We don't have that in our culture, in our society, but for those people of the day, they did. They didn't have to struggle to understand all of the intricacies of the stories and how the promises were fulfilled. Also in the, the first 10 chapters, it's very clear that Jesus is far superior to all that has come before. Jesus, whether they were looking at the, the um, processes they used, the traditions in the temple, whether they were looking at the promises that were made on a temporary basis to the people of Israel, Jesus was far superior to all of those. He was the ultimate provision. And it's almost as though, as the author is going through these first 10 chapters, he is saying, I want you to be very, very clear that God made a promise that Jesus is the long-awaited and the eternal provision of that promise. God has delivered on the promises that he made. He has never faltered. He has never failed. And even though it's taken ages, God has delivered on that promise. So he spends the first 10 chapters going deep into that and helping the people understand how those promises were now fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Something happens halfway through chapter 10. So that's where I want us to look specifically at a few verses here. I'm going to look at Hebrews chapter 10, and starting in verse 19. There's a really big shift that takes place. So all of this discussion about the ancient, uh, the, the ancient that held to the faith, those uh, forefathers of the Jewish nation, all of that discussion, even for the people of, of this day, that was ancient history. But in verse 19, there is a really big shift. And the author moves to say, what was ancient has now become very personal. So I want us to uh, start by reading here in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. You see, the author was saying that there are now new realities for us, things that were absolutely unheard of until the presence of Jesus Christ. He's saying those ancient reminders, those ancient promises, as they were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, they also restored us to that relationship with the Father. 
So those eternal realities are in a very concise way wrapped up in this chapter, nine, uh, verse, chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. He says, you now have confidence to approach the Father. You now have a high priest that is in God's presence that can clearly represent you. He is the great high priest above any we've ever seen before. You have the freedom to come near to God. And you can do this because you have been cleansed. You have been made clean through Jesus Christ. You see, that, that is really, really important to realize that this was absolutely unheard of for these people. And for the, them to now realize that this is the position we have. We have been called into a personal relationship with the Father. So that's, that's a really important thing for us to understand as we go far forward. Is the foundation is set clear. You have been called into, invited into a deep personal relationship with the Father. That's 10 through 19. But it goes beyond that. It goes into the immediate circumstances as well as that eternal provision. And we're going to see in these following verses how the immediate circumstances of the day are also included in God's faithfulness. You see, sometimes we can get a little bit lost in realizing, well, yeah, I've accepted Christ, I've entered into that relationship, and that gives me the eternal security, the eternal presence with the Father. But man, I am going through some circumstances right now that just aren't pleasant, just aren't enjoyable. But is God really going to speak into those? We're going to see that he does speak into those. So that's where the author has set them up to say that, yes, you can be assured the foundation is set. You are invited into that relationship. You are called into that. Then he moves on as he goes into uh, verse 23. Let's read that. It's Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So when the author hits this part, he says, I want you to hold on to, do you understand the hope that I have just spoken about, that I've just told you about? Okay, that's clear. You've got that foundation solid. Good. Now what I want you to do is I want you to hold on in an unswerving fashion. So the word there, unswerving, it's, it's really important because it's almost like the author is saying, I want you to cling to this, to Hug this in a way that it will not escape your grip. I want you to have a firm and clear grasp on this hope that you've been given. It's fascinating because hope in our current context, in our society, it's a pretty scarce commodity. It's fleeting. Whatever, especially in light of this pandemic, whatever people may have been leaning on, in the past for hope in this life is evaporating. It doesn't matter if your hope was in science or the government or the economy or the con if you look at the greater context of what the world is going through, uh, how we get along as one another. Um, all of these things, these are hopes that are being betrayed and fleeting. But the author calls us to a different hope. Remember, reflecting back on the foundation that this is what's secure, this is what's solid, this is the hope you can cling to, and it will not shift, it will not move. This hope is secure. Again, that hope is God's faithfulness. He spent nine and a half chapters talking about how God fulfilled his promises over the ancient of times. He wanted the people to really understand that. Be very, very clear. Here's how God has met. And now, here's how he's going to continue meeting you in the circumstances of your life where you're at. You know, it's, it's one thing for us to, okay, I agree, I understand. Yes, that hope, that faithfulness is true. God's made it there. And, and I'm, I'm holding on to that for myself. It brings me comfort. But if, if we take that hope, if we hold on to it, and if we go back in our home and we close the door and we just crawl under the covers, then we've really missed the opportunity. We've missed what we're being called to in this passage. You see, because hope must become a 
expressive. Because in the expression of that hope, the invisible God is made visible. Let me say that again. The hope must become expressive. We can't just bury it deep within and just hold it and hide it. It must become expressive. It must work itself out in our lives. When that happens, the invisible God is made known. That's much the way it was with the provision of Jesus Christ, with his coming. Yes, there were these long, long awaited, these, these points of hope that had been given. But when Christ came, it was the visible expression. Here's what God promised, and here it is now delivered. And if you look through Christ's words, he is continually pointing back to the Father. He's continually acknowledging, I am sent by God. And that's an opportunity that we have as we live out the hope in our lives. It's to make the invisible God known because of the hope, the foundation that we have. So you might be saying, well, how do we do that? How do we actually make that hope expressive in our lives? Well, that's what these next few verses are going to talk about. And remember that thought I wanted you to hold on to about being a provocateur, being a provocative presence? That's what we're going to talk about in verses 10 in chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, in this NIV version, they use the word spur. Uh, King James uses the word provoke. And that's, that's really close to, to what the original language was, was that we should be provoking one another. But this provoke doesn't come with a negative context to it. We're going to see how it's a real positive context. But first off, he starts this verse by saying, I want you to consider one another. Now, this is the same word that he uses in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. And in that context, he is saying, I want you to consider Jesus Christ. So it's not just a, a flippant, a light word of, okay, hmm, I thought about it, now I'm on to the next thing. No, in this word, the, the very root of this word is almost to study. So the author is calling us to say, I want you to consider one another. Literally, you could read that as, I want you to study one another for a very specific purpose, but I want you to know one another, to study, to be aware of what's going on in one another's lives. That's the root of this word that he's calling us to use. If you think about that, he's talking to people that he's expecting authentic community to take place. Because I, I don't just study a random person that's walking by, but I, I do want to study and I want to be aware of the people that are in my family, the people that are in my close circle, so that I might know what's going on in their lives, so that I might know how to speak into their lives, or to be a presence there. That's what this word brings us to. Then he moves on, he says, consider one another so that we can spur, so that we can provoke. And that word, the, the, the root of it is that we might incite others to action. That we might incite them into doing something. Something that might not be normal, might not be typical. But because of what we are spurring or provoking, they will take action in a certain direction. It's also interesting to note that this relationship that he's talking about here, as we study one another, it is reciprocal. It is one another. So it would be an error if someone were to say, mm, I think my sole responsibility now is going to be the provocateur of this community. So I'm self-appointed. I'm going around. I'm always provoking the people around me, even towards this positive part. But with this little phrase added on, it's like, no, this is reciprocal, which means there may be times where in my life, I need a brother or sister to step in and to provoke or to spur me on. There may be times when I need to provoke or spur another person on. And so it's reciprocal in nature. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being on either side of that relationship. But according to this passage, it's because we are in relationship that we can do that for one another. The most important part about this is all of these pieces are taking place is the end result. 
The end result is that love and good deeds might be taking place within this community. This community that is studying one another, that is alert to one another, that is looking for ways that I can spur or provoke you on, that's a close community. And the end result in that close community is that you would see evidences of love for one another and good deeds expressed to one another. That's what the author is calling them to as they are living through their context, which, as a reminder, wasn't a very pleasant context for the people receiving this letter. They were in a challenging place. So you might be saying, well, how does this really look? What does it mean if, if I'm being a provocateur? It sounds pretty vague. It's, it sounds pretty big. How do I know when I am? It's not complex, but it is challenging. Here's the one phrase that if you lock onto this, this captures in essence, what we're being called to. So being the appropriate kind of provocateur in my faith community means that I say things that direct people whose hope is wavering to help them hope in God. I live in a way that points to God's faithfulness. You remember the whole buildup to this verse 24 was he is talking about God's faithfulness, God's provision, how that puts us in position, how that puts us in a, a restored and a right position. And it's the foundation that I might be able to say things that will direct people around me whose faith is wavering so that they might see God's faithfulness, that they might lean into his faithfulness. That I live my life in such a way that it points to God's faithfulness in my life. And that should be a provoking, encouraging experience for others to look at me and say, wow, if God's faithful there, he can also be faithful for me. The author continues on with some more encouragements for the people here as he goes into Hebrews chapter, or verse 25. He says this, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, it's, it's really interesting because this has gotten some press, some traction, especially in this day and age where we're dealing with the isolations, with the lockdowns, with the different restrictions. But that's not necessarily what this is talking about, that we're not supposed to be coming together on a Sunday. He's calling them to a deeper community here. He's saying that your proximity to one another should be so close that you are able to do this in a normal life fashion. That's impossible to live out if we are staying isolated from one another. Not in the sense of what the government's called to these isolations, but I'm saying if we are relationally isolated from one another, living unto ourselves, it's impossible to be in close proximity to where I can encourage my brother or sister if their faith is wavering. I have to be close enough and engaged in relationship so that I will know this is when their faith is wavering. Or I will be able to say, wow, here's where God's been at work in my life and it speaks into your life. That's what he is talking about here. When he says we shouldn't, we shouldn't forsake, it means like, well, I shouldn't just walk away from community and being engaged in relationship. I need to stay close. You know, the interesting thing is to live out what he's calling us to here actually happens more on a Monday to Saturday experience than on a Sunday morning. Sunday morning's huge. It's critical. It's important. And that's where we come together. We, we hear and we're challenging God's word. That's that's a blessing that we have, that we can do that. But for this kind of relationship, he's calling them to understand that hmm, that's going to happen as you are living life, as you're going through. You know, you remember we, we talked a little bit about some of the context. Well, if, if you go and if you read on in verses 32 to 34 about the 
context that these people were living in, you find out that the author was saying, in times past, when, when, the, when you first believed, when you first came to faith, remember how you went and you spent time with one another in prison? You stood beside one another as you were being oppressed. When your properties were taken, you comforted one another. That wasn't happening when they were meeting together as a large community on, at, at, at whatever common gatherings they had. But those kind of experiences were happening as they lived life together. And that's what the author is calling them to right here. He's saying, don't abandon one another. Don't walk away from one another, but see the opportunities. Consider one another. See the opportunities that you might be able to encourage, to provoke one another on to God's faithfulness, that you might understand how he is faithful even in your immediate circumstances that might not be pleasant right now for you as you go through. So that's what the author had to say as he's calling them to this kind of community, a community that will be provoking and encouraging one another. But I don't want us to, to miss the flow, and I don't want us to forget the context. The flow starts like this, is that, number one, we need to be really clear of our understanding of the position we have, of how God has met us, how God has been faithful, and has put us in a right position with himself. We need to be really clear of that. And as we understand that, we embrace the hope that he has given to us, that he has embedded in us, knowing that he is active and at work in our immediate circumstances as well as in our eternal realities. And then we need to consider one another to be alert to what's going on in one another's lives so that we can reach out and so that we can encourage one another, so that we can take the things we're experiencing and encourage one another, or at times... We may ask for encouragement from our brothers and sisters to recognize, I'm struggling. I'm going through a difficult time. I, I am looking for someone to be encouraging me in my faith. So that's the flow of this context. That's what's going on. Now, you may know that right as he comes to the conclusion, the author of these verses we've been talking about, he goes immediately into Hebrews chapter 11. Doesn't, doesn't even take a breath. Steps into Hebrews chapter 11 which, as you know, is that great hall of faith. Even for the people reading this letter for the first time, these were ancient stories. These were provoking stories that they were to hear, that they were to, to remember. Oh, God made these problem, promises to our forefathers, to those who have gone before us, and he was faithful to them. And you know what's fascinating? If you read through those stories, you do see where God said, I am going to send an ultimate provision that will restore a relationship. That's going to come. I'm going to give you a temporary reminder, but I'm sending a permanent one. It's coming in the future. But also as you read these stories, many of these stories come from people who their immediate circumstances were desperate, were difficult, were challenging circumstances that they were going through. If you doubt that, you can read through the first few stories. We won't read through all of chapter 11, but you can read through the first few stories and go through there. And then as you get over toward the end of the chapter, the author says, I don't even have time to go into detail about these stories of these people who were cut in half. These people who lost everything because they called on the name of Jesus Christ or they were looking forward to what might be coming and they were prophesying about Christ. Those are some pretty desperate circumstances. I've never gone through that. But the author says these people were clinging to the faith that God would deliver on what he had promised and he was helping them in their immediate circumstances as well as the ultimate provision of Jesus Christ to make it through. That's a sobering thing. And maybe as you read through some of those stories, maybe you remember, oh boy, I remember um, uh, when I was in Sunday school going through and hearing those stories. And yeah, those were stories that really encouraged us or, or drew us or helped us to understand here's how we live out our faith. 
It was happening for the people when the letter was first written. It should be happening for us today as we read these stories. But there's something that's really, really important to not miss, and that's this. Going down and looking at verse 39 in chapter 11, it says this. These were all commended. So he's re referencing back to all of these people of the faith that had lived. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. That is staggering. So the author is saying even those stories, those ancient stories, those heroes of the faith are huge that He's saying only by being together with us are these made complete. So in this passage, he used the word perfect, but it's not perfect like, oh, because of our faith or because of our story, it's now without flaw. That's not it. It's, it's made complete. It's put together. It's given, oh, here's what that looks like in our context. That's what it looks like to live out this faith. So the author is saying we take our place with those ancients, with those that have seen God's faithfulness demonstrated and held to it, even though it cost them their lives. We take our place with them, and when we do, it brings a completeness to the understanding of God's faithfulness for those people that are around us. It's almost like I get to see it lived out real time. I'm sure that in this community, in the community of Toulon, there are those people that you look at and say, wow, they really saw God's faithfulness and they clung to him. They did not let go of that faithfulness as they made their way through difficult life circumstances. It may be actively worked out right now. You may be seeing it. That's what we're called to. That's what these believers were called to. You see, because some of the things they were going through, they were stepping away from the faith. They were abandoning it, walking it away. And the author is saying, don't do that. Hold to the faith. Hold tight to it. Because when you do, it brings a completeness to today, to our understanding of what God's faithfulness looks like today in our real-time circumstances, in our real-time context. We are given that privilege to have a place in that. You know, after he gives that encouragement, he moves into this uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and that was our opening passage that uh, Pastor Henry read for us. That is a tall order. If you read verses 1, 2, and 3 of Hebrews chapter 12, that's a big expectation. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. You may be hearing these words this morning, and you may be saying, I have lost heart. I am depleted. I hear what you're saying. I understand those stories. Yep, those, those are amazing. Those are God's provisions. But frankly, the circumstances that I am walking through right now, whether it's the, the pandemic or physical or financial or relational, I'm, I'm spent. I'm depleted. So when I hear you say these words, it's almost as if it's draining me even more to say, wait, I've faltered. I've fallen down. Do you know that it's almost as, those, as though that was the anticipated response? Because look at what the author says here. After he goes through, tells, run the race, keep on going. He concludes that little passage by saying, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. This author was not tone deaf to the reality of our circumstances and the pressures that that brings to us. He's saying, focus on Christ. Find those 
provoking stories from the ancient times past, but also find the provoking stories in our real time, in our current context, so that we might be encouraged to continue in the race, to hold the faith. For me, there is a tremendous encouragement, a tremendous insight that I find in this chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. And I want to read those for you. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. That, that language is not quite how we would talk like today, but what the essence of that verse is saying is that even though we are, we're in the race and our knees are weak and faltering and our hands are getting weak and unable to hold on, the author is saying, do not let go, even though you're in that depleted or diminished state because God is faithful. And even in that state, as God reaches out and demonstrates his faithfulness to you, he will use that to provoke and encourage others so that others that are becoming behind you that might not be as strong as you are in your faith might see your example, might cling on to that example and have the strength to move forward in their faith. It's a big challenge. It's a big ask. But the author is saying God is faithful and he can meet us in that. So how do we apply all this? How do we really take something away? How do we take this ancient passage of Scripture, this ancient book, and make it mine? So here's, here's a few questions that I'm going to leave with you uh, as we conclude this, this message. Number one, am I anchored in His promise? He is faithful in absolutely every circumstance. The author of this book took nine and a half chapters to say, here's how he has been faithful in the past and how it makes a difference for the eternity going forward. He has also been faithful in all of these circumstances that these people navigated through life. So, am I anchored in his promise that he is faithful in every circumstance of life? Is that, do I understand that even at, at the base level for myself? Then, Am I in a position right now today that I can provoke someone on in their faith or do I need to be provoked? That's the blessing of that little, that little addition in the one verse of it's a one another thing. Maybe I need to reach out to a brother and sister and say, man, I need to be encouraged. I'm going through this really this significant challenge. Or maybe we can reach out and say, man, you, you need to know I've seen God at work here. It was in a relationship, it's something I've been praying for, or financially, or physically, or in health, but I've seen God at work here, and it made a difference for me, and you need to hear it, you need to know about that. Then, am I in proximity to one another to see and encourage? You know that consider, that earlier word that was in that one uh, verse back there, in chapter, in chapter 10, verse 24? Am I close enough that I can actually see my brother or sister and know them well enough to know how to encourage them? Am I that close to them? And the last question that we have is, am I prepared with words and actions that will point to God's faithfulness? Am I prepared for that? Is that kind of in me to say, as I look around and as I study and as I'm aware of the people in this faith community, I am prepared with words that I can step in and say, here's how God has been faithful. Here's how I've seen him. I've been waiting and watching, and I see him at work in my circumstances. And the bottom line is that as we fulfill our mandate to be a biblical provocateur, it's to go into each day with the context of saying that I will say things that direct people who's wavering, that their hope is wavering, to help them hope in God to live in a way that points to God's faithfulness. And I leave you with that, to embrace that thought, to put that into practice on a regular daily basis as you go forward, living out and provoking one another to love and good deeds, demonstrating and recognizing God's faithfulness in this community.
Let's pray in closing. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the time that we could look into your word. Lord, we know that you have been faithful in the ages past. We read it. We see the stories. We see the provision, the ultimate provision of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that we might be able to see that faithfulness in our lives, that we might be alert to it, that we might be looking, and that we might use it to encourage one another as we go forward following you, that we might live lives that are marked by your faithfulness and by our obedience to your direction, regardless of the circumstances that we navigate on a regular basis. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Chopper, for that word of encouragement to us. And we trust that you have received the encouragement yourself to uh, spur others, to provoke others, be a provocateur of love and good works. We have a wonderful song that the message has been talking about, God's faithfulness, and it's sung by Robert um, Christening. And uh, it's entitled, What a Faithful God We Have. Oh Lord, I come before your throne of grace. I find rest in your presence and fullness of joy in worship and worship. I behold your face, singing what a faithful God am I. What a faithful God am I. You are. What a faithful God. What a faithful God.
What a faithful God I have. Well, I trust that you are convinced of God's faithfulness in your life. And for the benediction today, Hebrews 10, 24, as the apostle writes these words, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Have a great day.